Well, greetings folks at Catholica. Here we are in Mississippi. It seems to be the heart of the American dream. Um, I'm going to do a short commentary today, which is based on my reading of uh, Francis Harvey's book on Roger Pryke. Uh, but I'll come back to that later. I just thought I'd start off with this opening shot of the beautiful place set, situated on a lake in Mississippi that we're staying at at the moment. On our flight to America, uh, I occupied my time by uh, reading, and I got through it right through the book in the end, was Francis Harvey's uh, biography of Roger Pryke. And uh, it's had quite an effect on me, and uh, I'd like to uh, discuss three things in this short uh, review of the book uh, that I'm going to present today. As I said, the, the book had three major impacts on me. The first one is, is really taken from the title of the book, Traveller to Freedom, uh, which is in fact taken from a project that uh, Roger Pryke was involved in in the production of a new uh, hymn book or song book called Travellers to Freedom. And I presume that's where Francis Harvey got the title for the book. It's really, I think, a search that all of us go through, the search for meaning in our lives, uh, which we derive from our uh, religious formation and background and beliefs, and uh, uh, in a sense, Roger Pryke seems to have become very disillusioned about that, and uh, I think his story would uh, accord with a lot of us who are searching for meaning in a place like Catholica. The two other impacts that the book had on me were to do with his later journey. James, in our forum, in his review of the book, uh, and James features in the book, by the way, he's, he's one of the correspondents with Roger Pryke, who, who is covered in a, a section towards the end. Um, he was disappointed that uh, we don't have enough about what happened uh, to Roger Pryke after he had left the priesthood. Um, I can understand that, although it wasn't such a concern for me. Um, the, what I was more intrigued about is his eventual uh, Alzheimer's dementia um, and that's uh, something that's uh, said much to me because of the journey I went through with members of my own family including my own father. But the third question that comes to me is, is linking back to the first question, the search for meaning in our lives. And it often seems to me, from my personal experience of what I went through in my family, that a lot of our dementia, uh, Alzheimer's and that sort of thing relates to when we can't get together all the questions in our lives, all the uncertainties, all the insecurities, and when we can't uh, deal with those in our intellectual, emotional and uh, physical selves that uh, that ends up manifesting itself. It's like our, our mind is a cement mixer, you know, one of those great big concrete trucks with all this stuff constantly bubbling away in there even when we're asleep. And if it gets to such a point where it can't make the connections in a rational, intelligent way that's what eventually leads to us, you know, our mind just breaks down in the same way that our, our physical body will break down if it's placed under too much stress. Um, so that's the, the third dimension of this book that uh, had an impact on me. Firstly, let's take this traveller to freedom, this search for meaning question. Um, 
I'm sure if I, I never knew Roger Pryke, I was resident in Western Australia on the other side of this continent uh, when his story was uh, in full bloom and uh, also I was young. I, I finished school in 1965 and uh, he was perhaps at the peak of his uh, influence at that stage and uh, I think it, there's one point in the book where uh, Francis Harvey says that that was the peak. He, it was an address he gave at uh, uh, St. Patrick's Seminary in Manly in 1965, which was the, the high point of his influence. After that, the authorities in the church tried to restrict him uh, uh, speaking to religious, speaking to seminarians and so on and he eventually left the priesthood in 1972 or 1973 and became a private citizen. Uh, I, I was influenced by a, a person of similar stature to Roger Pryke in Western Australia who was our chaplain at the University of Western Australia who was a similarly chari charismatic priest uh, who I suspect influenced quite a number of people over there. His name was John Hart, uh, SJ, he was a Jesuit, um, and he certainly had a huge impact on my life, not unlike uh, what seems to have been the influence of Roger Pryke on a lot of people in New South Wales and further afield around Australia. Um, I'm sorry I didn't know Roger Pryke's story a lot earlier. Uh, I, I, you know, we, one of the things that occurs to me today is, uh, you know, I feel as though uh, I've misunderstood uh, what the whole Catholic quest is about. Uh, I wrote about this recently. I thought it genuinely was a search for truth. But uh, what's increasingly become apparent to me is that to a lot of people, and I suspect even a lot of priests uh, who joined up, they don't see it as any search for truth or, or any intellectual quest. It's about helping people. It's about being part of a community. It's about identity, uh, rather than all these esoteric things like getting to heaven or salvation and all those things, they're, they're sort of the icing on the cake, you know, if you're a good person to other people and you you uh, obey all the rules, well, you know, eventually you'll be rewarded with this thing called eternal life. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever approached it like that. I've, I've seen it genuinely as a search for uh, the truths in our life and if we find that truth, eventually that will bring us to uh, eternal life or uh, a, a sense of fulfilment in our lives. I do still believe in an afterlife and that there's, there's something that comes after this and it is related to uh, how we uh, traverse the journey through this life. Um, now, Roger Pryke, it seems to me, was, was very much in that sort of intellectual mould that I uh, speak of, uh, or how, how I understand it, that this whole journey is about trying to find the truth in our lives. It's not about trying to find the truths out there somewhere, you know, in these Ten Commandments, or, you know, what the big laws are that God gives us about you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife or their goods and all these sort of things. They're, they're important and, you know, I'm not trying to, to denigrate them, but uh, the truths that really matter are the ones as to how I deal with a particular problem in my life. You know, it might be a, I get into some sort of conflict with my employer or my boss or my archbishop or my, uh, you know, in Pryke's case, that very much was a conflict between him and his boss, who in this case was a cardinal archbishop. 
uh, and also <laughs> our bishop as well, to Muldoon. But um, uh, the, the, the important truths that matter in our lives, the ones that bring us to salvation, is not how many times we can say, I know that you know, the Ten Commandments are dip, 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 dip. Uh, the important thing that brings us to some sort of fulfilment, some sort of place of equilibrium, some sort of place of peace in our lives, is how we navigate the particular challenge. If we have a conflict with our husband or our wife or with our boss or with the local parish priest or some other people on the pastoral council or, you know, in our workplace or with our children. And it's, it's making the right moral uh, decisions in those relationships um, with those particularly those close to us, so that we bring them uh, the, the conflict, the situation, whatever it happens to be, to some place of equilibrium, some place of peace, some place of um, where we're all in equilibrium with one another again. Now, um, uh, what I want to go on and say, say in the other two sections is that Roger Pryke's story, in a sense, is of one who wasn't able to resolve those sort of things. And ultimately, uh, what I'd argue is that that is related to uh, some sort of mental collapse where we, we can't resolve the irresolvable. When I was a lecturer at the Swinburne Film and Television School in Melbourne, uh, the head of our department, Brian Robinson, who's now left us, um, and the late Brian Robinson used to say that every story needs a premise, every film needs a premise. A, you've got to be able to sum up in one short statement what this story is about. Uh, you know, boy meets girl, falls in love, falls out of love, uh, you know, what's the meaning of it all? Uh, the great human stories of the quest for self or the quest for meaning. Uh, it seems to me Roger Pryke's story is the young man, uh, idealistic, enters the priesthood, search for meaning, search for the meaning of my life, uh, meaning Roger Pryke's life, uh, his personal life, you know, what's it all mean, what am I trying to achieve? Then he finds himself in conflict uh, with the values that he thought uh, his religion, Catholicism, was about. Uh, uh, the aspect of personal relationships, uh, the importance of community, uh, I think one thing that comes through to me in Roger Pryke's story, which I've found in my own personal story, is the importance of having a confessor, or what I call a soulmate in your life. Um, and, you know, one of my big things against celibacy is that I think we all hunger, not for sex, but for intimacy in our lives. We search for a soulmate. Not a person we can get undressed of in front, uh, undressed in front of physically, but undre undressed in front of in our psyche and in our spirit. There's one person that we search for in our lives who we we can uh, share with our deepest vulnerabilities uh, with a sense of complete trust that that person is never going to share uh, our vulnerabilities with a wider public. So it's confessional in the sense that you, you need a sense of trust like uh, we tr were traditionally taught of in Catholicism in the seal of the confessional. And usually where most of us find that is, is in a, a marriage partner. Uh, uh, although, you know, I think society at the moment has uh, 
really questioning this, you know, with the, the great rate of marriage breakdown. We need a lot more education and rethinking this whole thing through of marriage, particularly now that uh, marriages are expect, expected to last, you know, 30, 40 or 50 years, whereas in the past when a lot of our thinking about the marriage, life expectancies were much shorter. And so when you're making a commitment for life, it was more in the realm of 20 or 30 years rather than 30, 40, 50 or even 60 years that you would spend with the one person. Um, Roger Pryke's life in, in brief summary then was of um, man goes into seminary in search of self, in search of these big questions which is given by the church. Uh, along comes the 1950s and 1960s when society as a whole started questioning things but so did the church and the uh, I believe sincerely that the the church the the uh, majority of the bishops of the world were genuinely led by the spirit in the 1960s as was John the 23rd in saying uh, our old certitudes are breaking down they no longer work people are no longer attending church in the numbers that they were you know half a century or a century before you know what's gone wrong how can we find a language that better tells this deep most fundamental story of the human search for meaning uh, in, an, in new ways that uh, better accord with where people are at today. Now as we discuss often on Catholica uh, that quest seems to have broken down and the insecure element in the church have taken over the institutional agenda and uh, people who are uh, who were inspired by the Vatican II story there on the outer. Uh, now Roger Pryke was one of the first of those. In a sense he, he had a sense of what was coming at Vatican II before Vatican II arrived. That's a major theme of what uh, uh, Francis Harvey explores in this book. Uh, then uh, Pryke found that it wasn't working, eventually he needed a soulmate, he found it in, in, in the wife of one of his flock, in a sense, and she found something in him. Uh, they married, uh, and the rest of his life was spent as a private citizen, and unfortunately we don't have enough of that story. The end of the story is that it ends in the black cloud of depression and uh, uh, eventually dementia where, you know, he, he couldn't even remember. The, the, the last line of the book, uh, which I found particularly poignant, was, um, uh, just let me find it here. Uh, I'll pick the book up. Um, uh, <clears throat> We're sitting in the busy little coffee shop and he eats, eats a large, fresh poppy seed muffin with relish as we sip our cappuccinos. The hand holding his cup is steady, his features tranquil. To an onlooker there would appear nothing unusual about this distinguished looking senior citizen enjoying a morning coffee. We look at each other and smile, the same broad, open, affectionate smile which has carried him through a long, eventful life. So what of Meg? Meg was his wife. I say, still looking into his eyes. Do you think of her still? Meg! Meg! He holds my gaze steadily, still smiling, but with, but with eyes which suddenly become curious. Who's she? Roger Pryke couldn't even remember the name of this soulmate in the, the final line of the book. It's, it, it ends at a very poignant note. In the third segment of this little video, I'd like to discuss that, that question. What's the meaning of any of our lives? I think 
Francis Harvey's book on Roger Pryke is really, in a sense, trying to answer that question. Although, in the end, I don't think it, Francis does answer it because, as James said in his review, perhaps the most interesting part is left out uh, in that Francis didn't have access to it because Roger was uh, not able to share it fully. To me, um, my own father used to say the rosary every day of his life and the last decade of the rosary uh, was all, always dedicated to uh, a happy death. Uh, from as long as I can remember him, uh, that was his uh, hope in life that he would have a peaceful death. In the end, he, he did have that. I was lying, resting in the bed beside him in the Fremantle Hospital when he breathed his last. And uh, the one thing I'm thankful for in my life is that I, I hope I was able to give my father, despite his dementia, uh, some kind of uh, happy or peaceful death you know he didn't go out in tantrums or in anger uh, he he was content he his life had been fulfilled and I think that's what we're all uh, seeking uh, I have a sense that people today have given up on the heaven, hell and purgatory stuff. Uh, you know, they're not uh, thinking that, uh, you know, there's a big party in the sky with all the dead rallies and all that sort of stuff. Some some still cling to that. Um, I, I do have a sense that we, we somehow return to the Godhead. Uh, I'm conflicted in this dualistic thinking, you know, that somehow the spirit goes back to the Godhead. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do have a sense that death is not the final say in everything, that uh, uh, what we do with our lives um, uh, does uh, lead to, to whatever comes after. And I don't think that we're uh, invited to end up in a state of confusion or some state of dementia where it doesn't all fit together and in the end the neurons simply break down chemically. I think the fulfilled life is meant to, to lead to happiness, is meant to lead to a peaceful death. So that when we depart this life, uh, we do so in a, a sense of, yes, I have done the best I could. I have, I have enjoyed life. I have contributed to this world. I have contributed to the building up of my community, the building up of my family. I've done the best I could. Uh, I have a sense of... Um, uh, I've done the best I could, um, you know, the, I think all of us would have a sense of, oh, I wish I'd done that, <laughs> that a bit better, it's like on this trip we're on at the moment. There's so many things I'd like to see, uh, so many questions I'd like to ask of people, but I know it's going to be impossible in the short space of 21 days, and so it's, it's a very... Uh, surface look at America that we're going to be engaged in um, and there'll be many unanswered questions that I'll return to Sydney with in three weeks time that I won't have answers to that oh I wish I'd spend another few days exploring that with so, uh, such and such a person or I'd gone and had, had a look at that monument or something that was significant in the life of the American people. But, and, and I think our, our life journey is like that, in that, that we'll have questions, you know, we wish we'd explored this little bit, uh, a little bit more than we did. But in the bigger, the bigger picture, what we're looking for, I think, is a sense of, I'm at peace. 
I'm at peace with myself, I'm at peace with my family, I'm at peace with my God. And, uh, and Roger Pryke's story to me is, is one of a person who didn't find that in the end. Uh, and I feel a deep sadness in that because I think the early part of his quest is that he certainly was after those sort of questions. The, after the answers to those sort of questions that lead us to a sense of equilibrium, that a sense of being at peace with ourselves, with our neighbours, with our, our God. And uh, he, like many of us, uh, was led to believe that the pathway to finding this is through Roman Catholicism. And in the end, he found that he'd been sold a pup, uh, to use a very Australian term. Uh, he hadn't been given <clears throat> the full story, and it was a farce. Uh, what, uh, you know, the behaviour of the people he was responsible to, uh, you know, in his cardinal, in his archbishop, and that sort of thing, that they were men of straw, that they were motivated by purely uh, humanistic sort of things, uh, you know, their own power or their own sense of uh, uh, search for certitude themselves and uh, they were not uh, open to listening to other people. Um, Pryke uh, was a person who was open to listening to other people but in the end I think the tragedy of his life was that uh, other people were not open to listening to uh, the world at large or to other people. And uh, that's the tragedy of Catholicism today. And uh, I agree with Ed Campion, who was both a friend of Pryke and who wrote the introduction to the book, uh, that uh, this is a very important story. Um, and. Uh, you know, I think it needs another book, Francis, uh, <laughs> at some stage. Uh, I'm not sure if you have the, or anybody will ever have access to the amount of information that you have to complete that story. But, um, you know, I thank you very deeply for the book that you've given us, for the insights into this man. And I agree with uh, Ed Campion that this is a very important book for any person who's seriously interested in the questions of what this great life quest is about. Is it purely a quest for freedom or is it a quest for peace and equilibrium in our lives? Thank you for listening.